faithful to us, and yet we walk away sometimes. We fall away. We break. We make mistakes. And yet you call us home. And we get to come home and experience victory once again, even though we don't deserve it. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything you They do. don't necessarily the practice pray. what they preach. Amen. In general, the church um, makes me feel a combination of probably nervousness um, and sadness. I remember uh, being told growing up that it's not whether you go to church that's important, it's whether you have God in your heart. Uh, and I've come to believe the opposite is more true. When it came time to announce our divorce, it quickly <laughs> turned ugly. Um, I, everyone I thought was my friend pretty much was gossiping about me <laughs> behind my back. There's a lot of rules that you have to follow and a lot of, you know, kind of uh, making things very formalized where it shouldn't necessarily be. The first thought that comes to mind is um, nervous, closed off, a little protected, um, just because I have been hurt by the church. How do Christians make me feel? Um, a little judged, um, because I'm young and I don't know everything. I feel like a lot of Christians have really separated themselves and put up barriers to only associate themselves with other Christians and talk with other Christians and only the ones that actually share the same religious and political beliefs. Well, not a whole lot. Um, I think they're basically the same as, as everyone else. The family who are also Christian and a bunch of people I don't know who are who are Christian but capital C and um, they they wear their religion like a badge of honor and it's almost like a weapon um, and they make me feel terrified quite frankly. <laughs> I think for me sometimes it's more about those quiet moments and not necessarily having to be in your face about your religion, but just how you treat others. I think that's like the most Christ-like thing you can do is to act in Jesus's name and follow in his behaviors and be a kind and good person and accepting and loving. Uh, I, I somewhat question whether he was a real person or not. I feel like Jesus has been removed from a lot of modern Christianity, and that's very sad. Um, but if I just think about Jesus, I think he was an amazing um, person, and I, you know, there's definitely a part of me that still believes in the Trinity, and um, I find a home in my own version of Christianity. Unlike the church and Christians make me feel, Jesus makes me feel safe. Um, makes me feel like everything's gonna be okay. Um, when I'm scared, when I'm nervous, when I'm anxious, when I'm angry, when I'm happy, I just, I need someone to talk to. It's Jesus. I feel his presence, and I feel that he's there, and it's not that I can deny that. It's not that I don't have great times where I am very thankful or have one-on-one -on -one conversations, but it's a struggle. I think every relationship is, but boy, when you put a lot of eggs into that basket, um, it, when it doesn't work out, it feels very personal or deliberate as well. And uh, 
So I go back and forth with that a lot, but I think if you go back and forth with that, that means that you have to have a relationship in the first place to go back and forth. Because I think religion sometimes ruins it for us. I just really try to put a focus on just being a good person and loving people like Jesus would. So even the worst of the worst, like trying to see the best in them and being there for people, especially when they need somebody. service to be the voice of they, and I'm not part of that. And so I reached out to former friends of mine from high school and college on Facebook who I knew were struggling believers or people who had left the church or were just not believers in general. These are teachers. These are lawyers. These are students. These are regular, everyday people that we come in contact with. And that's what they said. And they may be right, and they may be wrong, but their feelings are valid. At some point, church or Christians made them feel that way. And I think you all know just by listening to their voices that that is not love. That is hard to hear because it really puts a check on where we're at. But these are the people we have to meet. And these are the people who have to meet Jesus. There's a movie called Vantage Point. It's one of my favorite movies, and I've actually talked about it up here before, but I'm bringing it up again because the concept is so amazing. There's actually a lot of movies that use this concept, but this one actually put it in the title. And basically, there's a terrorist bombing at this political speech, and you see it from this point of view, and everybody's freaking out, and you're like, I know who did it because I saw it. It was right there. And then they start the story over and change the viewpoint to a different character. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe it wasn't that person. Then they do it again. And you're like, oh, this was the person I thought did it, and it is very obvious now that they didn't because I see it from their point of view. We have such a struggle as the church seeing things from the point of view of lost people because we get in this bubble and we feel so comfortable in it. And we do some service projects here and there, and that's great. But we don't get really down and dirty sometimes. Some of us get stuck in this bubble and just sit in it. And you can't spread the love of Jesus if you're not out being like Jesus. So here's something that I've heard a lot, and this is from my mouth too. Oh, those poor things, I don't know what they were thinking. Or I don't know what they're doing out there. Out there, like it's a separate place. But I want to bring to light something. We're the ones who say, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. So why don't we go find out? Instead of just from a distance going, oh, my goodness, everybody is so messed up out there. I don't know what's going on. So go figure out what's going on. Go listen to people's stories. 
stop reacting to the sins of the lost and start interacting with the lost. Praying is great and does a lot of good. But let's stop just praying and start participating in those people's lives. Let's start doing something about it like Jesus did, like his disciples did. Their feet were dirty. Their clothes were dirty. There was sweat on their brow. They were tired, and they kept going anyway. And they sat and got taught, and then they went and did stuff. They did take time to gather together like we do. But then they left, and they did stuff. They did stuff for lost people. Love is a verb. Love is active. Love is to do. John 13, 34, and 35, which was at the end of the video, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another by this. All people will know that you are my disciples. And if you have love, if you have love for one another. The strong temptation is to just say, well, he's just talking about disciples loving one another, and then everybody will see that and be like, oh, that's great. Let's go to church. But the problem is even the church argues with itself right now. So we can't figure that out either. But if we're known by our love, that means when people see us, the love of Christ emanates from us. If I give somebody a ham sandwich and they swear up and down that it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, then it's not a ham sandwich. It's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because they're doing the eating. Their valid truth is that it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because maybe when they were little, somebody told them that's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's the same thing as these people who are hurt. Their reality is that Christians hurt people because that's what happened to them. Christians disagree. Christians are about disunity. Now, we know that to not be true, but their vantage point is different than ours, and so we have to step into their vantage point. So the question really is, how can we make Christ's love valid to other people, valid to people outside the church? Make it real for them. Make it known for them. Well, I'll tell you right now, without Christ, we can't. The other problem is this. We come to them trying to look so clean and so pretty, and we forget to acknowledge our brokenness. I want to read this quote for you. This is one of my favorite quotes. We cannot properly grieve over anyone else's sin until we have first grieved over our own. Unless you are willing to admit that you have struggled, that you have sinned, that you are broken, that you are hurt, and you show that to them. You show them your truth. Your testimony is not just a glorious story of you coming to Christ, but a story filled with ugliness and brokenness and pain and sweat from when you were young to when you came to Jesus. You have struggled, and that's good because struggle builds character, because struggle builds faith, because struggle builds hope, because we know what the target is. But they don't have a target, my friends. They don't know Jesus. And they probably are going to have a hard time associating with somebody who comes in and says, hey, Jesus has made everything perfect in my life. I've never had any problems. Or just simply won't talk about their problems to these people because they don't know them. We have to be willing to grieve and be hurt and show that ugliness is included in our story. Then there's this. We look at them, and we just focus so much on their heart hurt. And sometimes our intent is good. It really, really is. Oh, I see the pain you have. Oh, I'm so sorry about all that hurt you went through. And I, and I get that. And that's great. But sometimes we have to stop fixing our eyes on their hurt and fix our eyes on their healing. 
Because when we focus on Jesus and act like Jesus and love like Jesus, then they're more likely to come to Jesus. If we let them tell their story and we stop trying to tell their story for them because we really don't know what it's like for them, then they're more likely to come to Jesus. So we have to learn to listen to the broken. We have to learn the difference between sympathy and empathy. Because it truly is time to step up. You see, sympathy goes up to somebody and says, I am so sorry for what you're going through. I really am. I have no idea what that's like. I'll pray for you. Have a good day. And that person's condition has not changed one bit. Instead, we go for empathy, which is, I am so sorry for what's happening to you. Can you please tell me your story? I want to know what it's like to be in your position so that I can properly care for you or point you in the direction of somebody who can. And you stay. I'm not saying stay instead of care. I'm saying stay and. And I know it's scary sometimes to go out into the world to places you've never been with people you've only known a little bit and go into their area, into their darkness, because it's where you're going to have to go sometimes, and be Jesus in that darkness. But sometimes you have to enter the darkness to see the light. Have you ever been in a dark room and your pupils are all huge and then somebody decides it's a good idea to turn on their phone flashlight facing right at your face and your pupils disappear? Yeah, that's the best feeling in the world, isn't it? <laughs> but guess what? It sure is easy to see that light when the rest of the room is dark. So when everybody around you and their situation and their condition, everything around you is dark, everything is hard, and you're just filled with the joy and love of Jesus Christ, boy, are you going to stick out like a sore thumb. And I got to tell you from that video, the thing that hurt me the most that was said by my friend from college who I knew intimately and spent every day with for a year and a half was they're just like everybody else. It wasn't the, the barriers. It wasn't the they can be mean, they use it like a weapon. It wasn't any of that. I've heard all that. It was they're just like everybody else. Because for him, we make, as a Christian people, as the people of God, as the children of God, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, we make no difference. And that, my friends, is the opposite of how it's supposed to be. Empathy leads to this word that is probably my favorite word and trait of Jesus Christ of all time. I love this word. And that word is compassion. Now, if you didn't know this, this is the cool thing about the word compassion. It is a Christian word. It's used all over the world, but it's a Christian word. In fact, the word passion is a Christian word because com means with and passion is from the Latin word passio, which means the suffering of Jesus Christ. With the suffering of Jesus Christ, we are supposed to have compassion towards others. We are supposed to suffer like Jesus for other people. He thrust himself into darkness, all the way into darkness, into death for us. That is the suffering of Christ. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. These traits are often looked at. People do message series on them, and they talk about these traits. But then we skip those first two words, which I think are so important to how we minister and disciple to the outside world. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't say have in your heart. It doesn't say inside your brain. It doesn't say think about. It says put on, as in clothe, as in everybody can see that you have these things. These are visible traits. 
These are traits that when you walk down the street, people will notice that person is compassionate. That person is kind. That person is humble. And if they get to know you, they're going to see it more and more and more. And then they'll get to the inside parts, and it'll be even better because the Holy Spirit will be spitting fire out your body, and you will be going crazy with some Jesus love. Wow. Put on. Something we do every morning mindlessly. We, we kind of worry about what we wear. I don't as much. If you couldn't tell. Every week somebody's like, there's those baggy jeans again. I love my baggy jeans. <laughs> okay? Put on so everybody can see it. So, so important. I can, I'm going to keep saying this is my favorite thing. That's what I do. I'm sorry. Everything, you can ask Carla, everything's my favorite thing. When something comes up and I like it, I'll just say this is my favorite thing. It's easy to look sharp when you haven't done any work. I saw this as I was scrolling one day. And I said, wow, never really think about that. Here's the thing. A lot of us Christians have great lives, and that's a blessing from God. But people, we are meant to get out and make our pencils dull and get tired and work for God and read the Bible. And take those extra hours to do that and make him a priority. And our pencil is going to get dull. It's going to get dull. But here's the thing. We are the ones with access to the sharpener. God is the sharpener. And we don't have those chintzy school smart pencils. We got Ticonderogas, ladies and gentlemen. We are sharpening our pencils. Sorry, former teacher, I really got a pet peeve for the cheap pencils. They never work. Uh, (laughs) But here's the thing. All those people out there, their pencils are dull too. All those lost people, their pencils are so dull. They have been working so hard to get ahead. They have been doing so much to try to get by. They have been starving. They have been tired. They have been sweating. They come home and try to provide for their family. They're having mental breakdowns. They're having mental health problems. And we're not immune from those things either. But guess what? We get to go to the sharpener. They don't know who the sharpener is. It's our job to point them to the sharpener. When they ask, why is our pencil so sharp? We got to say, no, it's not because I didn't do anything. And then we show them that by doing stuff. And we get dull with them. And then we drag them along to the sharpener. Guess what? The sharpener is going to hurt a little bit. Because it's going to shave some off the top. Now, eventually, you're going to come to the end of your story. Your pencil is going to be this long. And if it's this long, you know what? It burns a lot better. So be careful. Get your pencil sharpened. Sorry, it's my favorite analogy. See, I did my best. (laughs) John 15, 5 through 11 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, He is thrown away like a branch and withers. You know what abide means? It means in accordance with. Now, when I was a kid, my dad, I didn't know what accordance meant. And my dad told me it means like you're attached to somebody with a cord. You're in accord with them. And And when I abide in Jesus, it means he's attached to me. It means I'm following him. He's pulling me along, not the other way around. I don't want to try to pull Jesus. He's the one who created the world, right? I don't want to mess with that. We have to abide in him. And then we bear much fruit. That's our discipleship. That's those lost people whose fruit had fallen on the ground and and their seeds have fallen out of the fruit. And those seeds get picked up and God says, This is for you to bear. And guess what happens when we lose our way and we try to say, oh, man, I'm such a good disciple. I'm so good at this. I am the king of discipleship. You're not really abiding God anymore when you do that. And then the branch falls off. And you and your fruit along with it fall to the ground and wither. There is a responsibility to discipleship 
to stay attached to Jesus. And I say all these things about going out and loving people and putting on compassion, but we can't lose sight that it also says to put on humility. And I think that's the biggest danger in discipleship today is we start to make it about us. And I truly believe, and I'm not throwing shade at anybody or anything like that, but I truly believe when we get to tell evangelists and we get to people who are all about them, That's not abiding in Christ. There's a danger to fame. A danger to fame. Sometimes I have to fight that just preaching to a church of 150 people or preaching to a youth group of 20 teens. I have to fight that fame. Because the fame leads to the flame. Here's what I know. When we do that, when we try, we try to take the supernatural for God. We try to transform people's hearts. But what I know, and Mark Batterson says this, is if you want God to do the super, you've just got to do the natural, which is just have conversations with people, love on people, have relationships with people that aren't like you, that are different, that are stuck in the darkness, that are struggling. Take your time with them. the last thing you need to do is go and start pointing out to them what they're doing wrong. Because I'm telling you right now, if you're pointing at somebody else's plank because you think you have a speck, it's probably the other way around. You're probably the one with the plank. Not every time, but a lot of times. Build relationships first. Show love and let God work on their heart. Our job is not to change their heart. Our job is to be next to them and with them and love on them as Christ would. Uh, Dave and I, Dave talked about this, went down to Orlando uh, for the gathering conference, and it was an awesome, awesome conference. And this last part of this message is not mine, but a gentleman named Albert Tate, who is an amazing speaker, an amazing man of God, uh, who I have... um, really been listening to quite a bit, and he talked about this verse, uh, this set of verses, this passage. A lot of people are probably very familiar with this. Raise your hand if you're familiar with this passage. It's been around a minute, you know, a couple thousand years. Uh, (laughs) Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So since that's what love is, let's run through that real quick and replace the word love, and they will know us by our love, with each one of these things. They will know us by our patience. How many of you are known for your patience? Not me. The worship team and tech team could tell you that. (laughs) Love is kind. How many people know you by your kindness? Awesome. I think that's one that's not as hard in our inner circles, but it's extremely hard for people who have a general assumption about Christianity. We have this thing where we say, well, that's not me. That's not me. That's just in general what they think of Christians, but it's definitely not me. Show them it's not you. Don't just say it. They have to know you to know it's not you. Right? I don't think I'm wrong. Okay? You have to go meet them where they are. You can't from a distance say, I'm kind. I don't think that's going to (laughs) work. Just a thought. Love does not envy or boast. Oh, my gosh. Christianity is so amazing, and I have been killing it with my Bible study lately. Even though James over there reads four chapters a day, woo-hoo, 
Yikes. You'd be surprised how many people who are struggling with church hurt and haven't said so, hear that and walk away. It's not arrogant or rude. We have a problem with rude, especially on social media. We need to work on that. It does not insist on its own way. (laughs) You can tell other people about the way of Christ without insisting immediately that they follow it. You follow it or you will perish. That's a good way to get somebody to come to church in 1945. This is not the same world, ladies and gents. They have other places to go. They have other things to do. Hey, you should come to church or you're going to be have a real bad eternity and you're going to go to hell. And they're going to be like, right now I'm going to the arcade. And that's they're not going to be hearing that. But if you say, okay, how about Monday night we go to the arcade together? How about Monday night we play some games together? We just hang out. I'm going to get to know you. I'm going to treat you as Jesus would have treated you. And then when you're ready, and you don't say this out loud to them because that's kind of weird, I'm going to talk to you about Christ. (laughs) And they might suspect that you want to do that. That doesn't matter in my experience. There's a 90% chance they know you're probably going to try to disciple them at some point. And they're going to be like, this is all a trick. But if you truly treat them with genuine kindness and compassion and you're not boasting and you're not arrogant or rude, that won't matter to them because they want to be safe. Safety is fleeting in today's society. Hope is gone. And if through the Spirit you can provide those things for somebody, they will believe you're authentic. They really, really will. You're not irritable or resentful, so do they know you by, like, you're chill? <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but do they know you by you being relaxed? Because Christ has taken all your burdens away. Does not rejoice at wrongdoing. This is, I'm, I'm not going to go over the other ones because of time. But let me, let me talk about something else. When somebody messes up, that you disagree with and you lean over to your buddy who you agree with and you say, I knew that was going to happen. What are we doing? Right. Why are we rejoicing that they're wrong? They've just got closer to Satan and we're laughing. When When the political candidate that you have disagreed with for years gets in office and somebody posts a meme making fun of something they said or did or something bad that happened to them, and you share it and get a good laugh out of it, or you don't share it publicly, you only share it with your one friend on Messenger who you know it's appropriate with and not appropriate with, and you think it's funny, what are we doing? You don't think Jesus sees that? He absolutely does. That's not love. Sorry to kill people's fun. But it's also not fun. It's not fun for Jesus. It's not fun for us. Guilty as charged, me too. I've done the same thing. So I'm not yelling at you. I'm with you. I'm saying we, as a church, as a body of Christ, as people who are supposed to be known by love, just need to do better. Jesus provided us the grace of of dying on the cross and saving us from our sins. And all he's asking us to do is go out and love on him, which is like the most pleasant, positive thing ever. It's frustrating sometimes. It's slow sometimes. It doesn't work sometimes. But if God puts somebody in your path, And it's really hard because they are really different than you, but it is very obvious that God put them in your path. And you start doing this thing, Lord Jesus, if I am supposed to help this person, please give me a sign. He did. 
he put them in your path. Now, whether that means you are their disciple or somebody you know is their disciple, I don't know. That's discernment, and that's up to you and them and you figuring out with God what you need to do next. But if you're praying, you're already in it, people. You can't pray it away. That's not how God works. You're already in it if you're praying, and you know it because you chose to pray. That video changed a lot for me, and uh, and I had to listen to it twenty times, <laughs> and it and it it hurt my heart to hear people I know, whether distant or close or in the past or the present, say that they're walking away from the church. But I'm sure you noticed the hope that almost all of them have some faith or some sort of trust in Jesus Christ. So there's a disconnect there, and we need to make Christ's love valid. And we need to be known by his love, not the world's love, not our love, but his love. And I wish I could change that. They will know us by his love. That is what this world needs. It needs us. It needs Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for your love, which we need to share with other people. Lord, I pray for relationships. I pray for courage. I pray for aggressive discipleship that reaches out into the darkness so that the light can be seen, Lord. I pray that we can make a difference like a difference has never been made before in this world, Lord Jesus. I pray that the people who feel that tug on their heart to talk to that neighbor who looks a little different, who thinks a little different, help them to have the courage to step out and say hello to offer them a meal, to have a simple conversation with them about anything. Oh, God, I pray for that connection. Because, Lord, unity of the body of Christ only goes as far as the people outside of it. And if we're not reaching out as a body, to connect to those people, they will never be able to be part of it. Lord, help us change this narrative that Christians in church are ugly and mean because, Lord, you are everything but that. And we want to be known as people